The ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future paid Scrooge a visit. We're going to borrow that concept of three as we embark on a jaunt in search of spirited places to ring in the new year. But our guides will be spirits of the alcoholic variety, the otherworldly variety, and the spiritual variety. Hello fellow restless spirit, welcome to our final episode of the haunted Christmas season here on the Haunt Jaunts podcast. But even though it's our last episode for this series, never fear, the end just leads to another beginning. We'll release more theme seasons in 2022. At the end of this episode, I'll reveal what next season's theme will be and when you can start listening which makes us a great place to quickly remind you to subscribe if you haven't already. That way you'll know when new episodes drop. For now, let's start exploring the spirited stops in this episode, which all revolve around a New Year's theme, including New Year's Eve. Some cities are more exciting to spend New Year's Eve in than others, especially if you like Big celebrations with throngs of partygoers, fireworks, and booze of both the alcoholic variety and the ghostly kind. Although, keep in mind that in 2021, as was the case in 2020, some of these cities are having to modify their celebrations due to the pandemic, or in some cases, once again, cancel them altogether. But in years past, and hopefully again in years to come, they'll be able to get back to the normal frivolity we once remember. For the purposes of this episode, I'm looking at these cities from a popular New Year's Eve destination standpoint like we used to know and hopefully we'll once again get to re-experience. We're going to start down under in Sydney, Australia. It's one of the first places to ring in the new year every year. But it's not the very first. That honor goes to the Pacific Island of Tonga. Anyway, I always think the firework display over the Sydney Harbor and the Opera House is a spectacular sight. On TV, that is. I've never had the pleasure of witnessing it in person, but I'd love to. I've never had the pleasure of visiting Australia at all, actually, but again, I'd love to. There are so many cool haunted places I'd like to check out over there, and one place I'd know I'd check out on a visit to Sydney is an area called The Rocks. It's a historic area with hotels, shops, restaurants, harbor views, and it's close to the Circular Quay, one of the most popular places to watch New Year's Eve fireworks in Sydney. There are several haunted hotels and bars in The Rocks, but I'm going to narrow it down to two, the Australian Heritage Hotel and the Russell Hotel. Both made the most haunted bar lists from AWOL and Hidden City Secrets. AWOL ranked the bars on their list according to spookiness, drinks, and aesthetics, and determined that the Australian Heritage Hotel had the best drinks. It wasn't the spookiest bar on their list, That honor went to the Carlisle Castle Hotel. Unlike their name might lead you to believe, however, the Australian Heritage Hotel does not offer accommodation in the form of overnight stays. At least not right now. As of this recording, it's a pub only. They do have a menu with typical bar food, burgers, pizza, and the like, but as AWOL put it, it's a great place to find lots of weird craft beers. As far as its restless spirit, allegedly a man named Maddox, who was murdered there, haunts the building. But he doesn't appear to hold any grudges, and according to The Rock's ghost tour, you may not encounter him in the bar. He's more commonly reported being spotted in the hotel corridors. 
I'm not sure if COVID closed down that part of the Australian Heritage Hotel's operations or if they scrapped it for other reasons, but at least you know you're guaranteed to find spirits of the alcoholic variety in their bar. The Russell Hotel is temporarily closed for renovations and is expected to reopen in 2022. Wonder if the work is stirring up its ghost. Although, AWOL reported that even though the Russell is often called the most haunted hotel in Australia, it wasn't very spooky. Their exact words were, The bar at the Russell Boutique Hotel is less spooky than a middle-aged aunt on a cruise. The hotel was built on the site of an old hospital. According to Hidden City Secrets, allegedly once upon a time, a prostitute murdered a sailor in room 8. Is that why some report seeing a figure in that room? And does that also explain why only single women ever report seeing anything? Our next stop for a great place for New Year's Eve frivolity is London, England. In years past, when they've had New Year's Eve fireworks for the public, one of the best places for watching was from the Westminster Bridge, which even has a New Year's Eve ghost story attached to it. Allegedly, as Big Ben rings in the New Year, an apparition jumps off the bridge. Hauntedplaces.org further elaborated that some speculate it's the ghost of Jack the Ripper. But since no one knows the infamous serial killer's identity, I'm not sure how anyone would know that. Even though it's maybe not ideally situated to enjoy London's New Year's Eve fireworks display, the Ten Bells is a haunted bar with Jack the Ripper ties. Country and Townhouse reported that Annie Chapman, the Ripper's second victim, may have been murdered after drinking at the pub. And some say that the Ripper's fifth victim, Mary Jane Kelly, may have picked up clients outside of it, too. However, Time Out London said paranormal activity at the Ten Bells might not be as Ripper-related as you'd expect. As they explained, another gruesome death may account for the apparitions people report seeing on the pub's upper floors. Someone murdered George Roberts, one of the pub's Victorian landlords, with an axe. Time Out London also reported some mediums have been so disturbed by sensing the murder of a baby that they refuse to go on the upper floors. A haunted pub more ideally situated to seeing the fireworks or at least getting to a spot to see them better, would be the Grenadier Pub. It's one of London's oldest, and many say most haunted. According to London Ghost Walks, the upper floors were once used as an officer's mess for barracks that used to be nearby. The cellar became a place for soldiers to drink and gamble. One soldier, who Time Out London gave the name of Cedric, was rumored to have been beat to death by his fellow soldiers, either for being caught cheating while gambling or for not paying his gambling debts. Many people, both employees and patrons alike, have reported experiencing supernatural activity, including tables and chairs rattling, a chill in the air that refuses to be dispelled, and sometimes even the sounds of moans coming from the cellar. Now let's proceed to Scotland for Hogmanai. It's a multi-night celebration that ushers out the old year and rings in the new. It's actually December 30th's festivities I'd love to see. As Visit Scotland so poetically described it, Thousands of torchbearers march through the heart of Edinburgh with flaming torches, creating a river of fire down the historic Royal Mile to Holyrood Park for the finale and closing celebrations. Then on New Year's Eve, revelers gather on Princes Street for party time beneath Edinburgh Castle which culminates in Edinburgh Hogmanay midnight fireworks shooting from the castle ramparts. 
video of which makes most newscasts New Year's Eve firework montages because it's such a spectacular sight to see fireworks illuminating the castle. Because of Edinburgh's history, there are a lot of haunted places in the city, including bars, but we're going to zero in on just one, the Banshee Labyrinth. Even if it didn't dub itself Scotland's most haunted pub, I would have had to at least mention it. But lucky for us, it's not only named after a type of spirit, but it serves them and is allegedly haunted by a restless one, or more, with a penchant for sliding drinks right off tables and smashing them into the wall. On the pub's website, they explain the building's history and how one half of it used to be part of the underground vaults, which was home to criminals, thieves, and the otherwise unsavory. The front half was once the home of Lord Nicol Edwards, one of Edinburgh's richest men. He was also Lord Provost of Edinburgh at a time when there were witch trials. It's believed he used the basement dungeon in his house to torture suspected witches before their trials. The pub derives its name from the Banshee, who is believed to haunt there. Here's the story the Banshee Labyrinth shares on their website. When refurbishing the venue, a group of workmen believed they all heard a terrifying scream. A few hours later, one of the workmen received a phone call informing him that a family member had passed away. Since banshees are thought to be harbingers of death, it seems like they picked a fitting name for their establishment. Here's hoping if you ever visit, you don't hear her wail, though. Okay, time to jaunt across the pond for New Year's Eve in the States. While there are a bunch of great cities to visit for New Year's Eve, I'm going to concentrate on two, one iconic and one up-and-comer. Let's start with NYC. Regardless of where we live, if we stay up to ring in the New Year and aren't out somewhere, there's a good chance we're tuned in to the countdown in Times Square. And one of New York City's most luxurious storied haunted places happens to be right near Times Square, the Algonquin Hotel. In the 1920s, it was a meeting place for creative elites who met there every day for lunch. We're talking folks like playwright Noel Coward, humorist and actor Robert Benchley, writer Dorothy Parker, and comedian Harpo Marx. They called themselves the Algonquin Round Table, but later became known as the Vicious Circle. Activity has been reported both in the hotel's restaurant, which is called the Round Table, but also in the rooms. Guests and staff alike have reported everything from disembodied footsteps and voices to apparitions. Some of the paranormal activity is thought to be due to the ghostly presence of former Vicious Circle members, but there's also some other mischievous spirits there, too. Ones who move furniture in guest rooms and cause the elevators to stop on all of the floors. NYC Ghosts shared that the Algonquin conducts a mini exorcism every New Year's Eve, where staff dim the lights and march through the building, banging pots and pans to try and ward off sinister spirits. I'm not sure that tradition still continues to this day. And if it does, if they warn guests about it in advance. I didn't find any mention of it on their website. Maybe there's no need to explain, though. Maybe guests just think it's all part of New Year's Eve revelry. One other fun thing to note about the Algonquin is their cat, Hamlet. As of this recording, he's the eighth Hamlet. The first was named in honor of one of the hotel's famed residents, actor John Barrymore. They named the cat in honor of Barrymore's greatest stage role. There have also been three cats named Matilda. If you're a cat lover, you can get social with Hamlet on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Okay, now we're at our last place to spend New Year's Eve with ghosts of the alcoholic variety. We're going to check out a city 
I've lived in for the last almost 17 years, Nashville. Music City has boomed in the years since my husband and I moved here, and they really know how to throw a party here. Their 4th of July fireworks display is now one of the biggest in the nation, and they don't slack on New Year's Eve either. Downtown is where you want to be to catch any of the festivities. They used to host most everything on Broadway, but more and more main stage performances and celebratory gatherings are at the Bicentennial Capitol Mall State Park. But of course, Broadway and its honky-tonks still see plenty of action, too. One of the oldest, most storied, and iconic honky-tonks is Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. It was opened in 1960 by Tootsie Bess. Some say she haunts her bar and makes her presence known by tapping her fingers on the end of the bar if an act doesn't impress her. But it's the ghost of a famous country music legend that earns it a haunted claim to fame. Many swear they've seen the ghost of Hank Williams Sr. doing everything from ordering a drink to performing on stage. Another Nashville landmark, the Ryman Auditorium, is right behind Tootsie's. Not only is it also alleged to be haunted, but so is the alley between Tootsie's and the Ryman. Hank Williams' ghost has also been reported there. Although, I'm not sure why his ghost has been reported at Tootsie's. He died suddenly of heart failure at only 29 on January 1, 1953 but he wasn't in Nashville at the time. He was scheduled to perform a New Year's Eve concert in West Virginia, but had to cancel. He was on his way to Ohio for a concert on New Year's Day when he died on the way. The last place he spent the night was the Andrew Johnson Hotel in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is another place some say they've seen his ghost. Maybe he just regrets missing out on performing at Tootsie's and is trying to make up for it in the afterlife. Speaking of the afterlife, one theory is that sometimes ghosts are most active on the day they died, aka their death anniversary. Let's next explore New Year's Eve ghosts of the otherworldly variety. Not that they necessarily appear around New Year's Eve, but they have a connection to it. But besides New Year's Eve, these ghosts share something else in common too. Suicide. I wanted to give you a heads up, since this can be a sensitive and sometimes triggering topic for some. Please feel free to skip ahead a little ways and catch up with me in the next section, where we'll explore spirited places of the spiritual variety to spend New Year's Eve. We won't linger here too long. And please remember if you suspect someone you know is contemplating suicide, or you yourself are, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-272-8255. You don't have to brave the darkness alone. I've often wondered if circumstances for the next two ladies might have been different if they'd had someone to talk to, like the fine people at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I've actually talked about both of these women in previous episodes. At least I'm pretty sure I mentioned the Drake's Lady in Red in Season 1, Episode 3, which was about the Drake's mysterious woman in black and the unsolved murder of Adele Bourne Williams. Williams isn't thought to be one of the ghosts haunting the Drake Hotel in Chicago, but a woman in red is. Some believe she took her own life on New Year's Eve and now haunts the 10th floor. Except, as is frequently the case with some of these ghost stories, I've had little luck confirming if such an incident happened. Something even mysterious Chicago confirmed. They reported they had no luck verifying a woman had jumped from the 10th floor once upon a time either. Although there could be a good reason it never made the papers, suicides aren't always published for public consumption. But the story goes that she was either jilted by her husband or fiancé on New Year's Eve, or caught him with another woman and was so distraught that she jumped. We stayed there one Christmas and I roamed the 10th floor looking for her, 
but she never appeared for me. The other ghost with a New Year's Eve connection was one who I know has had her own episode here because she's one of the more interesting ghostly characters I've ever come across. She had her own episode, Season 1, Episode 41, The Hotel Captain Cook's Possessive Potty Poltergeist. Her death didn't make the papers either, but when we took the Anchorage ghost tour, our guide, Richard, implied he'd confirmed a woman had in fact shot herself in the last stall on the left in the women's bathroom. He'd spoken with one of the Hickel family members who owned and managed the hotel. They knew about the tragedy and explained why they ultimately decided to permanently bolt that door shut. Too many people using that stall reported terrifying experiences, including the walls suddenly starting to shake and the feeling that unseen hands were grabbing their ankles. But milder accounts include feelings of uneasiness, feeling sick and sometimes even fainting after using the bathroom, and seeing the apparition of a woman in white. The Hickel family member in charge then may still be the same person in charge now. She started visiting the bathroom to talk with the ghost and give her updates on the hotel's operations and such. It seemed to appease the ghost. She also instructed staff to shut the door to prevent anyone from using that stall. But, of course, sometimes people forgot to do that. When one of her dear friends emerged terrified and disheveled after a harrowing experience in the bathroom, relating that she'd been among those to experience the shaking walls and the ankle grabbing, enough was enough. No one knew why the woman had decided to kill herself during the celebration of the opening of the second tower in 1972, but she was reported to be an angry woman in life and seems to be staying that way in death. And just for the record, I'm not 100% positive the celebration took place on New Year's Eve. I wrote that down in my notes so during the tour, but for full transparency, I may be off on the date. But the tragedy did happen during the celebration of the opening of Tower 2 in 1972. Anyway, since she was really only possessive of the stall she died in, they decided to bolt it from the inside so it could permanently remain closed off for use by any other humans. And it seems to have helped. Although some people still report seeing the apparition of a woman in white in that bathroom, as well as sometimes experiencing the lights flicker on and off for no apparent reason. I didn't experience anything when, when I went to use the bathroom there, but I did stand on the toilet in the stall next to hers to see if the door was really bolted from the inside, and sure enough, it was. Now we're going to switch gears and wrap this episode up with a quick look at spirited places of the spiritual variety to ring in the new year. I don't mean religious necessarily, but what some people have reported feeling and experiencing in these places is sometimes likened to having a religious experience. I'm talking about places where you can find energy vortexes. Be My Travel Muse had a great article about energy vortexes, including summing up what they are and why they're spiritual. They're thought to contain more of the Earth's energy because they exist at ley lines, or the lines that make up the Earth's magnetic field, or what some believe are ley lines that make up the Earth's magnetic field because no one has truly proved those exist, but there's many who believe they do. Magnetic fields are believed to power all kinds of things, including supernatural energy that helps spirits manifest, but it's also believed humans can also harness the energy for prayer, meditation, and healing. At these energy vortexes, people often report feeling more centered and connected to themselves and whatever higher power it is that they believe in. Side effects of energy vortexes include feeling more peaceful, harmonious, and tranquil, as well as more in balance, clear-minded, and emotionally rejuvenated. 
which is why I thought it'd be fun to quickly cover a few of the places you might find energy vortexes, because what a great way to usher in a new year, right? Not that we can get to a lot of these places maybe this year, but for future reference. So the one I'm most familiar with is Sedona, Arizona. The whole place is considered an energy source, but there are four specific places, each delivering their own kind of energy, that people most often seek out, and that would be Airport Mesa, Cathedral Rock, Bell Rock, and Boynton Canyon. The other two energy vortexes in the U.S. are Mount Shasta in California and Maui's Haleakala Volcano in Hawaii. England has a couple of places, too, including Glastonbury and Stonehenge. Esvedra, a huge rock in the Mediterranean off Ibiza's coast in Spain, is one of Europe's energy vortexes. Other impressive landmarks from ancient cultures that are also considered vortexes are the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt and the Mayan ruins in Tulum, Mexico. Have you ever visited an energy vortex, whether for New Year's Eve or not? I'd love to hear about your experience. Feel free to shoot me an email at podcast at hauntjaunts.net, or if you're listening on YouTube, just go ahead and leave a comment. Well, That wraps up both this episode and the haunted Christmas season here on the Haunt Johns podcast. My name is Courtney Maroc, and it's been my pleasure to be your host and guide this season. If you've enjoyed sailing the airwaves with me, ratings and reviews are always appreciated. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Speaking of, I promised to share what next season's theme will be. We're going to explore macabre museums and where to find museums dedicated to everything from witches, vampires, and the paranormal to death, true crime, and magic. The jaunt starts on January 31st, 2022. I hope you'll join me then. But if you can't wait that long, you can always jaunt with me online anytime at hauntjaunts.net or tune in and watch on YouTube. For now... Whether you celebrate big and bold or small and subdued, I hope you enjoy a very spirited new year. Until our paths cross again, ciao for now.